Welcome to this week's DDU teaching. Um, we have a few of us in the room, so Dashani, Louise, and Adam's joining online. Uh, we'll talk through pitfalls in hemodynamic measurement, and um, we'll keep it interactive. And um, it shouldn't take an hour; it should be done in about half an hour uh, for this one. Uh, so, an important topic for us in the ICU. And let's go. So, we're going to do this sort of magic seven, I guess. Just can't do lots of things in the space of this time. So I've chosen seven things to talk about, um, which are quite fairly common pitfalls and some tips and tricks for um, various aspects of hemodynamic measurement in the ICU. Um, so we'll talk through ejection fraction, cardiac output, LVOT obstruction, stenotic virginate lesions and diastolic function, and a little bit on the right side. So for the left ventricular ejection fraction, it has its place, but we have to treat it with respectful caution. And we've talked through this one before. Um, can you, so important for tracing the four chamber and the two chambers, like you need to be in orthogonal views. And obviously the pap muscles and the trabecular are part of the cavity, um, as is a prominent septic knuckle. So that all forms part of the LV volume. And um, we need to look at um, two things, I guess, when we're trying to decide whether these views are orthogonal or not. Obviously, eyeballing can help, um, but between the four and the two chamber, we need to have two things. Um, which are dash? Uh, so I guess the LV length has to be within, I think, the LV within ten percent. Nice. Yeah, lovely. So that's it. So the, this LV length in <coughs> diastole in the apical four chamber has to be within 10% of the LV length in diastole um, in the two chamber. And that's how you can sort of know that you're orthogonal and that your volumes are going to be as accurate as they can be with, with 2D echo stuff, um, which is not perfect. Which brings me on to this um, common sort of scenario in the critically ill. Um, where we have this poor endocardial border definition. And it's often with, you'll probably find this when you're scanning, it's often with the anterolateral wall and the anterior wall, I think where we run into the, the most trouble with this. Um, and you can imagine, you know, trying to, to trace out this border here and this border here, it'll be quite, that'll be quite difficult. So I think if the clinical, if the clinical question is one of you know an, an accurate ejection fraction or regional wall motion abnormality, and we need some and we need some accurate you know sort of accurate volumes or accurate assessment of regional wall changes. Then we ought to be using contrast more in our patient group. Now this is a patient. This is the same patient here. It was a day apart. Actually, what wasn't a day apart it was a couple of hours apart, and you can see it's exactly the same uh, patient. But now the anterolateral wall is much more accessible, and um, as is the anterior wall in the two chamber here. Um, I'm sorry that's not playing, but um, this patient had a, a classic Takatsubo type appearance with basal sparing. Um, that classic octopus, Japanese octopus catcher shape, and went on to have a normal angiogram. Um, but you, you wouldn't be able to really tell that from the from the non-contrast imaging. So we should be, um, you know, not afraid to use contrast agents. They're very safe and they can uh, give you a lot more information in the, in the right clinical context. So it's important when we're interpreting ejection fraction that we consider the left ventricular and ventricular geometry. It's really important. So this patient is a clear, you know, it's a burnt out sort of dilated cardiomyopathy, um, terrible ejection fraction, um, as you can see there. When you actually calculated their symptoms, whether you believe this or not, their ejection fraction is 21%. But that's not the, the point of this learning point is the the learning point is that, you know, you can, um, because you've got remodeling of your LV and you've got large end diastolic and ends, um, end diastolic volumes, your stroke volume can still be preserved, even though your ejection fraction is down. And this is a common finding in this type of patient um, when they're, you know, they're set up looking reasonably well with no end organ hypoperfusion. And that's because this patient, despite having this ejection fraction, still has a stroke volume approaching 90 mils and a cardiac index of 2.8. So he's warm, well perfused and not shocked, um, despite appearances. And I'm sure we've all seen patients like that. So LV geometry is important um, at the extremes. This is one extreme. The other extreme would be a patient like this. Um, so, you know, you've got a small left ventricular cavity, tiny, right? But the systolic function looks 
looks all right. Um, so systolic function is preserved. I mean, without assessing, we're going to assume that this patient has diastolic dysfunction for sure, and they'll be at risk of things like mid-cavity LVO. But um, based on these images that I'm showing you here and this uh, bullseye of their strain, and <laughs> what do you think this patient, what would be the, what would you be thinking for the cause of this patient's thick, thick wall and uh, thick walls? So you think there's, there's multiple things to consider. Um, Infiltrative disease would probably be number one, given that there's relative apical sparing, and you'd think about early amyloidosis. Lovely. The yeah. other option, so that you should think about, would be long-standing hypertension, although yeah. it's not usually this severe hypertrophy, or aortic stenosis, because they may be contributing factors in their own right. Yeah, lovely. So, so having that sort of roadmap for causes of LV hypertrophy, as Louise just pointed out, you know, it's either going to be a, a, a pressure, a chronic pressure overload, for which hypertension and aortic stenosis would fall into that, or it's going to be an infiltrative disease, such as amyloid would be the top one, but other things like Fabry's disease is becoming more increasingly rec recognised. Um, and, you know, disorders of the muscles and cells, so genetic things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, and then strange sort of, I guess, glycogen storage diseases, um, et cetera. But you can imagine this, you know, you, you could find something like this in a renal patient with hypertension, for example. But the reason um, this is more likely to be amyloid here is because we've got this classic apical sparing, so this cherry on top appearance, that's um, classic of amyloid. But the point I really want to make with this is that even though you've got a normal ejection fraction, you've got a reduced stroke volume in this patient because they've got a small cavity, small end diastolic volumes and small stroke volume, which is only 40 mils by pulse wave Doppler there. Um, so interpreting the ejection fraction in the context of LV geometry is important. And these are some other scenarios where we have to uh, treat the ejection fraction with um, respectful caution. Um, Louise, might you want to just comment on the LV function? Okay, there's thickening of the septum. Um, there's probably systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve and possibly left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The actual walls are generally thickened. I can't see in the so that's a in the transesophageal view. Can't really see the apex that well, but certainly in the. That's all you're getting. That's all I'm getting. Is it? <laughs> it won't play again for me. Um, nice, but so I mean, yes, all of those. I would need to slow it down in this patient. So, but, oh, that looks like obstructive cardiomyopathy is quite also a possibility given the extreme hypertrophy. Yeah, I think um, it's difficult to call it on that one view, isn't it, as you were saying there. Um, I think the, the, the things to point point out is obviously we've got a hyperdynamic left ventricular function and it is the walls do look thickened. But remember, we can get pseudo hypertrophy when we've got hy hyperdynamic left ventricles. Um, and I don't there isn't there isn't if you. So there isn't Sam here, yeah. um, but there is um, there's been a pap muscle rupture and you can see that the oh, structure there just flailing into the LV, LA when I slow it down a little bit. It's hard to see in this, this view the, um, to appreciate that. Um, but in systole, the, you know, the mitral valve is, is not, uh, not on the LVOT, so it's not LVOT obstruction. But I guess I'm just pointing out that, um, so for this patient, um, and let me just show you the other one as well. So, so we agree that that's a hyperdynamic ejection um, heart contractility, right? And we'd probably call that ejection fraction 70, 75% and say it was hyperdynamic. Um, and then the same for this patient. You know, we'd call that left ventricle hyperdynamic systolic function, um, ejection fraction, whatever, high, right? Not very little blood volume. Exactly right. So, and why do we might think that is? I've already given it away for this one. Um, so I've given that away for this one because what this patient had um, is their papillary muscle ruptured off um, after having a myocardial infarction and they've got all of their stroke volume is going back into the left atrium. So this patient is cold, shocked um, and in real trouble if they don't go to theatre soon and they did go to theatre and have their mitral valve repaired. Um, and then in this patient, uh, you know, their 
equally as cold and shocked because all of their stroke volume is going through that uh, ischemic serpiginous VSD into the a low pressure right ventricle. So don't be fooled by um, a hyperdynamic systolic function. Um, you've got to think about why the patient's hyperdynamic and explain why that ventricle is hyperdynamic. Is it because um, you've got your offloading into a, a lower pressure chamber for whatever reason, whether that's a shunt or a regurgitant lesion? Is it because you're vasoplegic and septic? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got it, you, or, you know, they've got a high output, high output state for another reason, such as thyrotoxicosis or whatever. And you so see, you've got to, as well as we explain a, a hypocontractile ventricle um, or reduced systolic function, we need to also explain um, a hyperdynamic systolic function as well. Um, and if you see things like that in a shock patient, you know, you need to go hunting for things like shunts and, and look a bit harder for regurgitant lesions, um, which is what that patient had. So the take home then about ejection fraction, and we're gonna leave it there, is that it's load dependent um, and poor LV function may absolutely be masked um, if we just rely on ejection fraction. And it is, as you all know, it's not analogous to cardiac output. So cardiac output measurement then, I think you know it's relatively straightforward, but there's some basic concepts that we have to do well um, when we're doing this. So as we, all know stroke volume is left ventricular um, outflow tract area times the stroke distance which is also known as the velocity time integral so it's um, especially it's essentially how far it's traveled um, and that's the velocity integrated over time to give us the VTI um, so it makes a cylinder and then we you know make the area of this times it by the distance and that gives us a volume and that's our stroke volume times that by the heart rate that's cardiac output so very um simple maths and um, makes a lot of assumptions and we i guess you know we could argue all day about how whether it's the you know whether the lv out it is circular we know it's not circular but i think for all intents and purposes this is a gold standard um certainly using echo and it's you know reasonable especially if we're using it for trends um, but there are some important things that we need to be aware of when we're making these measurements so first one is the LVOT diameter measurement. Whatever me um, errors we make here, they're going to be squared um, because it's um, you know pi r two pi r squared, um, and we're going to make um, uh, you know pretty big measurement errors if we if we overcall or undercall that. So what we ought to do is zoom into the parasternal long ax axis view. I often find reducing the dynamic gain just to make the the black and white structures appear more. Um, you know, the contrast, um, uh, reducing the contrast to help uh, delineate those structures helps. And we're going to measure inner edge to inner edge um, of the leaflet insertion points. And it needs to be parallel and adjacent to the, um, essentially parallel to the um, orientation of the aorta, ascending aorta, and we're going to do it at the leaflet insertion point. You'll notice there that I've just put or at the site of VTI measurement with a little star, and I'm going to come on to why that's important next. Um, and it's important that you do it when the leaflets are maximally open, which is in mid systole. So I think if we were doing these things, then we're giving ourselves the best chance of making an accurate measurement, um, which is obviously important. Um, now Doppler is angle dependent, um, or, you know, the cosine angle. And as we get past 20, 30 degrees, um, the percentage error becomes unacceptable. So we try to keep our uh, Doppler angle below 20. The machine assumes, I guess, like our partners or parents that we're perfect and we're absolutely not. So it assumes an angle of zero. So um, yeah, just be mindful that we need to absolutely try to be um, completely uh, parallel with flow and if we can't be then sort of 20 degrees is, is really the maximum uh, percentage error and so a tip and trick for that when we're moving on to measure VTI um, you can see here that in a standard five chamber we go straight down if we go straight down the the gun barrel of the LV with that that we're going to be you know off by some sort of angle and make it inaccurate um, whereas if we, you can see down the bottom here, if we just bring the tail of the probe more medially, um, then we get a picture that looks more like this here. So you're bringing the, the LVOT around to this side of the screen and you can see there now that you'll be much better aligned for, you know, pretty much perfect uh, Doppler 
angle analysis. And you want the sample gate to be set at three to five millimeters and you want it just behind the aortic valve because that's where you're, you're taking your VTI measurement for the, from the leaflet insertion tips, right? Um, and then what we look for, if it's in the correct place, is this nice closing click. But there are caveats to that. And I think this is really important for the ICU population where we see a lot of flow convergence as they're coming up to the aortic valve. So we know that we move from this laminar sort of flow profile with you know, normal non-turbulent flow. And then as we come towards a narrowing uh, orifice, we get these eddy currents form. And so we lose this laminar flow profile and we get this whole mixed array of different velocities of red cells. So we don't know if we measure in this so-called flow convergence zone, um, we are not measuring the modal velocity. We're measuring, are we measuring it here, here, here? If we're measuring it here, this is the peak velocity. It's not representative of the mean spatial velocity of these red cells. So what's recommended um, in this paper here by Miller et al, where he goes over all of the sort of um, physics and caveats of, of measurement and things is that we use color Doppler to, obviously we do this anyway, to spot the flow convergence zone. And then we put our pulse wave um, sample gate just behind the, the flow convergence zone. So if we use a uh, color Doppler here and we're right in the flow convergence, you can see that we've got this really fuzzy LVOT trace. There's a lot of spec, um, there's a lot of dispersion. Um, we have got the closing click, um, but we're right in the flow convergence zone. Whereas if we move the gate back out of the flow convergence, we're going to get this much more laminar profile. And this is the modal velocity, not the peak velocity. So if we measure this one, um, we're going to be overestimating the LVOT VTI. Now, second one doesn't have a closing click. It doesn't though. have a closing click, exactly. So you don't, you don't always get the closing click and you don't always need to have the closing click because if you if you um, have a patient with aortic stenosis um you're measuring their vti there um you're gonna you know completely screw up the the uh, aortic valve area measurements so i guess the clinical scenarios where this is particularly important is aortic stenosis patients um, and anyone else with flow convergence. So dynamic LVOT or big septal knuckles, um, anyone with a hyperdynamic circulation, um, you know, with the VTI, we, we should be measuring modal velocity, not peak velocity. So it might be worth just having a read of that, that particular article. It's, um, it's quite nice. But the take home is avoid the flow convergence and tailor it to your patient. And perhaps if we're going to be measuring it here, then we should alter where we're measuring um, our LVOT diameter. And, and that's debated a lot in, in recent texts that have come out discussing that. So this is an example then of, a, an, of an LVOT VTI trace. And it's overgained. And we can tell that because we've got all this speckling in the background. Um, and it's traced poorly because it's it's tracing right, you know, right at the outer edge of the of the um of the of the modal velocity we should be in this mid part of the brightest signal um which is the mean spatial velocity so the things that we can do here then is to turn down the gain and we want to trace the modal velocity which is the middle part of this dense signal um, and we need to shave the beard so we're not including all this fuzz down here um, and this, you can see that if we use this one, the LVOT VTI is 22. And this one's probably a little bit underdone there. It could be brought down a bit further, but the LVOT VTI is 17. Um, so you can imagine, you know, if this would be interesting to assess this in, in our patient group, looking at inter and intra um, rate of variability on VTI measurements. It'll be interesting to see what our uh, spatial dispersion of those numbers would be, because I think we all do it slightly, slightly differently. But I, you know, it, it's certainly in in one lab, I think we should be doing it one way. Um, and you know, this is sort of the the recommended way that we ought to be doing it. So dynamic left ventricular outflow obstruction. Uh, key things are don't miss it and recognize the different Doppler profiles. So common to our patient group. This is a patient that had a GI bleed and came back and had escalating noradrenaline requirements. Um, so Desh, what can we see here? Um, sorry, I'm going to look at that 
Oh, it's just a few slides. <laughs> uh so you see uh i mean you could maybe say that there's so it'll be hypertrophy again this is only in the one view it looks like it's contracting really well um really hyper dynamic yeah yeah um and there does seem to be some mitral regurg as well in the, you can see it there nice yeah. touch. And completely on my own, unprompted by the other slide, I am concerned about that. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, so it's a little bit hard to see without without slowing it down. But the thing that we can see, say, as soon as we're putting a colour Doppler on that, is that we're getting aliasing of, aliasing of colour flow. Mm -hmm. So that's important to mention. Um, and that means that the velocity of the cells are more than twice um, the pulse repetition frequency, right? And that's why we're getting wraparound and aliasing. Mm -hmm. So that's happening around the LVOT. And then, you know, classically and then I guess the causes for that would you know you would need to think about have you got some obstruction there um so then you would look closely at this mainly in the in this view but also in the parasternal long axis view dropping m mode down and this patient had systolic anterior motion in systole so they did have evidence of SAM um another thing that you need to look for when you when you're suspecting SAM and dynamic LVOTO is this um, is mitral regurge, right? And classically, because of the anterior leaf that's been pulled across towards the septum and systole, then you're going to get this posteriorly directed mitral regurge. So if you've got a patient where you're seeing this sort of phenomenon happen and you're getting massive central regurge or anteriorly directed regurge, you've got to go and look at look at the mitral valve for other intrinsic mitral valve pathology because it's likely that that MR is not related to sound. All oh, right. Um, so classically you see this posteriorly directed um, MR with SAM but the key part of this is not not really the the MR or anything or the SAM it's more to be able to recognize the flow profiles that we see. So this is the flow profile taken from this this patient and how do we know this is and this is showing what dynamic LVOT is right so this is the M mode picture where the anterior leaflet has been pulled towards the septum you've got septal contact and therefore you've got all of those blood cells trying to squeeze out squeeze out squeeze out and so you get this peak sort of late peaking um late peaking profile um a classic of dynamic left ventricular airflow tract obstruction. So that, that's what's kind of happening. But how do we know that this is not mitral regurge? What are the things that we look the at? The timing and the duration. Nice, so what about the timing? So yes. the timing of mitral regurgitation starts very early in systole. Um, the LVOT trace starts later. Yep, so we've got timing and duration so um, mitral regurgitation continues throughout the whole of systole do you mean you classically get more of a parabolic shape Is that kind of... yes yeah um yeah although that's not really a reason it's, it's yeah. the timing yeah so timing is absolutely important um so this is a common scenario where you know we can easily confuse left ventricular outflow obstruction with mitral regurg and we don't always get this beautiful delineated you know two discrete different uh, flow profiles there unfortunately and we're often left with something that looks a bit like this and a bit like this and you're like oh is that mr or is that lvot obstruction so there are a couple of um you know things that you can use um a few little tips and tricks and roadmaps that you can use so this is some this is MR and this is LVOTO and the things that we're going to look at are the timing as Louise mentioned the shape and the velocity so with with mitral regurge as Louise was saying you you're you're getting mitral regurge in the isovolumetric relaxation and isovolumetric contraction periods so before you know just as you're this is your inflow profile here and you've got the onset you know even before that starting so during that isovolumetric period it's already started and then it extends out um into the isovolumetric contraction period it's already started and it's um ending you know after the isovolumetric relaxation period whereas you can see with dynamic lvoto there's this 
the space here, this gap, this isovolumetric contraction time, and the same for isovolumetric relaxation. So timing, I find, is one of the most helpful things. And um, the other thing is the shape, um, which is helpful. So with with mitral regurgitation, it tends to have this parabolic shape. Um, if it's chronic MR, that is. Um, with severe MR, that you can um, be confusing even more because you get that triangular shape because of the huge V wave in the LA. Um, so that's not always the case, but generally speaking, MR is parabolic, whereas your LVO, dynamic LVO obstruction is dagger shaped. So you get this sort of, you know, as I was saying, sort of late peaking dagger shape or saber tooth um, shape that's consistent with LVOTO. And then the velocities is the other thing that, that can often um, give it away. So generally, mitral regurge is reflecting the pressure gradient between LV and LA. It's all to do with your LV contractility. So again, in someone with a normal left ventricular left ventricular systolic function you're going to get velocities at, you know five six meters per second whereas with dynamic lvo it tends to be less than four and a half but this is all general and you're going to have exceptions to the rule but i think if you use those general rules you'll get it right most of the time so timing shape and velocity to help differentiate um, so in this patient we've got the isovolumetric periods um, that are not included we've got the late peaking dagger shape um, this shape here and then we've got the max velocity which is you know in someone with a hyperdynamic lv if that was mitral regurg should be way down um into the sixes six six meters per second but don't always rest on as i say one thing you need to look at the whole clinical picture you know interrogate the quality of your image and uh, really think through those different components because it's not that uncommon that we see dynamic lvot velocities that are approaching the fives and, and that's when it does become a bit more difficult as well and remember that you know dynamic lvoto and mid cavity lvo are going to be very different um that, you know they're going to be different etiologies they're going to manifest differently and their doppler flow profiles look different as well so this is a patient with again a hyperdynamic left ventricular function um, and we're using pulse wave doppler to figure out where the obstruction is um, and classically in mid LVO, we get this very late peaking rather than having that gentle slow peaking, we get this really sharp um, late peaking and it's been described in some texts as looking like a stiletto heel. So this kind of profile and you can see we're down here, we're down to sort of between one and one and a half and two meters per second. So much less than the velocities we're dealing with, with mitral regurge or dynamic LVO. Um, so this is classic profile for mid cavity LVO. And you can figure out where the obstruction is coming from. So, you you know, you've already put your continuous wave through there. You've figured out that there's a high gradient somewhere. And then you need to figure out where that's coming from. And you, you it's called the um, velocity step up. And you're basically looking to see where the aliasing is. <clears throat> so you're going to use color to help guide that as well. So you're going to use color just like here. And then you're going to step down, put your pulse wave sampling gate down each one of these. Um, and then, you know, behind the valve as well. And then you're going to see where the aliasing occurs. So in this patient, it's somewhere, you know, just proximal to the to the um, aortic valve. And you're going to you're getting this aliasing occurring here. Um, what do you mean by the like in the spectral? The spectral Doppler yeah. aliasing. You see how we're losing it. OK, so it's going off the page. I see. Um, it's the that it can help up the top. Yeah, yeah. the little ghost. Yeah. So yes, use this velocity step up um, using pulse wave Doppler to help locate, help you locate it. You can get a good visual if you haven't got time, just using color Doppler, because you'll see where the early things start starting to happen. Um, but this is to be more precise about it. So in summary, then there's, you know, not every outflow obstruction is the same and you're going to have different profiles and it's important to know the difference. In LVOT obstruction, you get this late peaking, but it has this sort of gentle slope and it looks more like a saber tooth. Generally, the velocities are not more than four and a half. This is a nice paper to look at this as well as wiggle it out. Um, in mid cavity, you're going to get this late peaking, but very sharp sort of stiletto heel Doppler flow. Um, and it tends to be much lower velocities than LVOT obstruction and MR. And then in mitral regurg, it starts early. You, um, volumetric periods are included. It's pa gener generally parabolic. Again, caveats with acute severe MR where it would be triangular. And generally velocities with a normal LV um, are going to be more than five meters per second. 
just just recap the different profiles and I find this really this one of the most useful things clinically when you're trying to figure out why your patient's shocked and you can sort of tailor treatment to whichever one uh, you end up finding so it's really useful I think in day-to-day -day practice this particular slide so assessment of aortic stenosis is always a real challenge in the critically ill as we as we know it's very load dependent etc um, but a few just simple tips and tricks uh, don't miss the high gradient and you know I think a lot of us sort of rush with this and we just use the apical but we're going to miss the highest gradient in about 50 percent of patients more around there um, if we're just relying completely on the apical view so maximize your windows use your parasternal use the suprasternal um, and um, with the, don't miss the, yeah I was going to ask you I was going to ask you so what what do you think this one is taken with suprasternal and this parasternal yeah nice and why uh, Get them, yeah. Yes. Why do you think? Why did you say that, Dash? What is it about the picture? Uh, well, there's no 3D image. Nice. That's a, that's a good giveaway. <laughs> and also the. Uh, and the, uh, the direction. Yeah, the direction, yeah. right? Because so you can see the flows coming towards you here. So you've got to be up here yeah. in your parasternal or suprasternal. Um, and I'll not talk more about that today. Perhaps we'll talk about it more in the aortic stenosis view because there's a few other little things to that. Again, um, you know, simple things are really important here. So ensuring parallel alignment, just as you do with your VTI and your LVOT measurements. So when, you, when you've got the pedal and you're just, you, you find this trace and you just have to rotate a bit both ways to see what the maximum velocity was because there's no 2D to guide you. There's no 2D to guide you. So you would have to just adjust the probe. You, you have the volume on and then you oh, listen okay. for when it, where it's loudest and you get sort of a good, it's, it's very um, volume dependent, I think. So that's how I've, I, I, I'm not very good at it. I've done it a few times. Well, I've done it a bit right, yes, and yes, yeah, there. and <laughs> some, I, it was only one time where I found a good one. Um, I'm not sure if these are mine. I don't think these are mine. I think these were shared by a colleague at St. Vincent's, but um, when you find it, it's quite obvious. And the suprasternal one is much easier because right parasternal, you have to lay them right lateral. Okay. Yeah, and do it right parasternal. But it's definitely worth, searching for um very 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 rarely you get the highest gradient in subcostal but generally um uh, and i wasn't going to go to but there's a certain groups where the you're going to get high the highest velocities in the parasternals and that's when your aortic root um aortic root to lv angle um, is more acute and then you're going to miss a lot more of those um, if you just stick with the apical views so Anyway, we should be interrogating all of as many views as possible and making sure the basics are right to not miss it. And then I see this all the time. It's a bugbear of mine where, you, you know, you trace out, you've got these nice um, spectral Doppler traces, but still a bit fuzzy and they haven't shave the beard they're including the fuzz in this um trace so um, but it is important especially if we're you know going to be trending these values you know because if we're tracing down here we're going to say that this is consistent with um consistent with um uh, severe aortic stenosis when in fact you know if you trace it correctly it's not so to trace it well um you need to increase the sweep speed i usually say between 50 and 100 try to get two or three good big envelopes on the screen you're going to average three in sinus rhythm or more than five in air um, and that's that's debatable but um and then you're going to trace Again, you want the peak velocity, but you don't want to include all this fuzz part here. So ignore the fuzz and shave the beard um, whenever you're tracing aortic valve um, spectral Doppler traces. And pitfalls then with aortic stenosis um, gradients so that they're, they're flow dependent. Um, and so this can be really quite tricky. Um, even in the non-critical care setting, it's really challenging. So it's even more challenging for us doing critical care echo. So I think we would do all agree that just looking at the 2D of that aortic valve, that it looks like severe calcification, severely restricted. Yeah. Yeah. Think about the gradient. The gradient is not consistent. Yes. Uh, I think... Is it three? I can't see the numbers. 
So the velocity is 3.3 and the okay, mean so gradient is 25. With moderate, but yeah. unfortunately, it's probably a low flow state. Nice, nice. And this patient did have a, a low flow state. And so that's what Louise was saying there. So we need to look at the a few more things when we see discordant grading like this, um, which we'll go into more detail when we talk about aortic stenosis. But we need to look at um, calculations of the aortic valve area. The, the DSI, what does that stand for, Dash? Uh, dimensionless severity index. Nice. And what's severe? Uh, so I guess the pelvic dysfunction. Oh, what's a severe DSI? Oh, it was a severe. Yeah. Um, 0.2, I think. Oh, point two, point two, point two, nice. So severe is a DSI of less than 0.25, moderate between 0.25 and 5, and mild above 5. Um, five. Point five, point five, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and um, aortic valve area, what's severe? Uh, point five. Point one. 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 One centimetre square. Good. And then the stroke volume index, does anyone know what um, the cutoff value for deciding whether someone's in a low flow or a normal flow state? 35 mils per meter square. You got it. You got it. Nice. So in this patient then, um, they had a DSI of 0.2, an aortic valve area of 0.63, and a stroke volume, um, index stroke volume index of 23.4. So um, in keeping with this discordant grading, where we've got, um, you know, severe looking on a 2D, um, moderate gradients, but we've got a low flow state and our other things that are helping us, such as the DSI um, and aortic valve area are in keeping with severe. So we you know, conclude from this exam that this patient has got discordant grading and they'll need to go on and have potentially more tests such as you know, dibutamine stress echo perhaps, although this patient was on dibutamine in the ICU. So he's kind of having his stress echo already. <laughs> he was very, very sick. And, um, and all they need to, you know, calcium scoring is the other thing you can do. So if you just, you know, that sort of um, algorithm, sort of flow chart you'll need to know for the American exam and, and for DDU's exams as well. So how you sort of try to categorize the different types of- So when, if he's already on dibutamine, do you remember off chance what dose he was getting at this point? I think we crit we cramped him, cranked him up to seven to seven point five, so we were giving him a good, we we're giving him a good debut to me. Yeah, and he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't recruitable. He actually didn't change his gradient um, with that increasing, which is a poor prognostic marker in these guys. So, so did he got, have viability? Yeah, I don't know. He didn't have viability, which is a bad, bad prognostic marker. So he actually just he went for a dead have a because um, he was surgical risk was felt prohibitive. From him. Um, so valvular regurgitation, a few little things for this is don't underestimate the eccentric jet. Um, that's a that's a key thing. Um, there's some tricks for maximizing your TR velocity and then to use the upstream and downstream flows. So Dashani, what's wrong? This is the same patient. A second apart, two, five, what? A minute apart, less than that, 20 seconds apart. What's the difference? What's happened to this patient? He does not to the scale. <laughs> Point three. Oh yeah. So the the scales. Um, I guess it's just more sensitive. So the gain of the the color is increased on the left yes. image versus the right. So the right is more reflective of. That's what we normally use. So. Yeah. Nice. So what? So lovely. So you. You know, the key point is always if you're seeing a big horrendous regurgitation jet, just always look up to the top right of the corner and check that you've you've reset your scale back to where it ought to be. Um, what scale setting do we use generally on average during our TT exams for, for valvular assessment? Six Yeah, so like 50 to 70. 50 to 70. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether you're in centimeters per second, millimeters per second. So you can make something look pretty um you know something that's mild look very severe if you've got the wrong uh, color velocity scale before we go it's all about the basics and um underestimating the eccentric jet i think um this is easy to do especially if you're not uh, familiar with looking at Get lots of echoes and things and you're just starting out you can very much underestimate the eccentric jet the other thing that i think 
we underestimate a lot is what we had the other day, Desh, with that colour split mm. Doppler artefact. And I'm going to include that case into these slides, actually, this is a lovely one. Um, but essentially, because you've got the Coanda effect happening, a lot of that inertial force has been taken away because of that wall hugging jet. And so the jet area is never going to look impressive, obviously, because it's going to be eccentric and wall hugging. Um, and if you're just eyeballing the colour and the jet area as a mark of your severity, as a qualitative assessment, then you're obviously going to um, make some big errors in, in underestimating that. So always just be mindful to take a closer look at any eccentric jets. And if you're seeing eccentric jets, think of mechanism you know why has this patient got an eccentric jet because they're very much more likely to be a primary valve problem than a functional secondary valve problem so whenever you see um regurge always don't automatically go to what's the severity of the regurge think what's the mechanism of the regurge and then think about severity and then think about how the ventricle and atrium and pulmonary circulation have remodeled as a result of the regurge um, and what we can do about it to fix it anyway so don't miss the the maximal TR velocity and a really good tip for this, I think, is to you can see this is your normal four chamber here. If you bring your program more medially, you're going to change into this RV centric view or RV modified view, and you often then can line your TR jet. Um, much more parallel with flow and we know from the Doppler equation that we showed earlier that that's really important for accurate velocity measurements. So if we can line that up, that works really nicely. You can see the scale there, 70. So anywhere between 50 and 70 is where we usually have that set. And then this is another trick that I learned from one of the sonographers at uh, St. Vincent's is that um, this one. So you can, you've got your, You've got your um, right ventricle here and your RV focused view. But you can imagine when I try to line up that tricuspid regurge there for, to try and get maximal velocity, it's completely off angle and major errors and complete underestimation because my Doppler, um, you know, the, the, the line of the ultrasound is going to be running down here. So my an angle of insulation is completely off which gives me this really crappy, incomplete spectral Doppler traits, right? And I measure using the Bernoulli equation, 4b squared, I'm going to get 23, which is completely underestimated that. But you can do a trick where you rotate the probe marker completely 180 degrees and bring the RV to the other side of the screen. And this works quite a lot. I use this quite a lot. Um, and then you can see that that's going to completely just be much you know better aligned and you get this lovely well not perfect but nice spectral doppler trace and, you can do that for five chamber or that's nice. yeah it's nice yeah, yeah i do it for the triumph five chamber too a fair amount oh. so just 180 degrees just bring it right over to this side of the screen oh. it works nicely some like a fair amount of the time um and then you can see now we're getting you know max velocities of 3.3 3.4 and pressure gradients of 46 so you can see how you can, you know, you can make such a, a difference by just simple um, sonography sort of techniques. It's good. And then this is important for us, I think, as critical care physicians, is we, you know, we find it difficult to often to quantify severity of lesions. And we can use these upstream and downstream sort of readouts, if you like, to help help guide us a little bit. So this is a patient with, um, Adam, might you want to comment on this, this clip? Struggling to, I think it's a, is it a five? Chamber? Sorry, it's a five chain, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of more focused on the LV. Um, so it looks like there is a um, significant amount of aortic regurgitation, is that correct? Um, and there seems to be, sorry. But, but it looks like there's a flow in yep. um, towards the apex when they shouldn't be. So I'm guessing that's in the regurgitation. Nice, Adam. So when whenever you like comment on it, right, always start with the simple things first. So like comment on the 2D appearance of that valve. So as Louise okay. was just sort of making it, it looks really thick and it's really not pliable. It's not, it's hardly moving, is it? And a little giveaway for whether there's stenosis here, which there absolutely is, oh, okay. is you're not getting much colour um, past the valve. So that's a little a sort of qualitative thing that you can look at for that. But the key point of this is the regurge. I just wanted to show you that. So here, right, you've got this, if I just pause it, you've got this um, significant, I think, regurgitant jet. It's quite broad 
um, it's almost taking up the, the LVOT diameter. It's hitting the back wall of the LV. But I think you, if you just showed that to, you know, a few different people, I think you'd get a spread of results in terms of is it moderate, is it severe? Mm -hmm. You know, I think people would be... Can we measure it? Hey. So oh. you, I mean, you could measure the, you could try. I mean, the it wouldn't width versus the LVOT width. Yeah, but not perfect, is it? No, no. But you then, you, do, then you, you do could, all the other stuff. Yeah, you could do and quantify and, it. Yeah, absolutely. You could do that. I think it'd be hard to do a PISA because it's, you you know, um, in different views. So you could look in the um, different views and measure things like vena contractor, um, do your volumetric methods, all your usual things that you could do. Um, but a really simple, and of course you're going to do all of that. But um, I just wanted to emphasise that. Don't forget your up and downstream effects that can help you. Um, often, you know, these ancillary tests that you have um, can really push you towards calling this severe. So, so what are the up, up and downstream? Yeah, so I'll show you. So for it, things like aortic stenosis and what have you, that an aortic regurge um, in particular, that's going to be things that happen in the aorta. So you can imagine if you've got regurgitant blood coming back up the aorta, um, then you know that's going to cause reversal of flow in the aorta. So we can look at the aorta, aorta in two ways. We can do the suprasternal view and look at the descending aorta, um, or we can look at the abdominal aorta. If you've got diastolic flow reversal in your abdominal aorta with a, an echo that looks like that, um, so if you if you interrogate the aorta and put pulse wave through it and you get a flow like this in this patient, you can be pretty sure that they've got this is severe aortic regurgitation. So use the information that you get from the um, upstream effect, which in aortic regurgitation is diastolic flow reversal in the aorta. If you're doing it from the suprasternal view, you're going to measure it. Ideally, your pulse wave sample distal to the left subclavian so you don't want it too far up because you're going to get a false positive um, in terms of flow reversal so put your pulse wave down past the left, left subclavian in the suprasternal view and if you're doing it in the abdominal aorta it's more sensitive um, and specific so if you do if you get this profile in the descending aorta it's even better than doing it in the suprasternal view but this patient you just use the so costal, yeah, and you're in your IVC view, and then you uh, tilt anterior, yeah. Um, and this is a, a toe probe, right? So this is the patient that had a toe, um, showing the aorta at the ninety degree view, yeah. And you're putting pulse wave through that, and you get this hollow diastolic flow reversal in the aorta, indicative of severe aortic regurgitation. It so, doesn't matter what the actual values for the flow are it's quality it's, it's quality yeah. Yeah. yeah no it's all about quinky and um yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's that. Better. It's that, but you're just capturing it with Doppler, absolutely. Um, so if it's longer than the first third of diastole, then it's severe AR. And it's um yeah, absolutely keeps in with the clinical exam. But but I think you might see quinky less than you see this. Oh, so you see you see you see this actually in what's either one, Corrigan's pulse or something. But you see this um more than you see this, you know, it's a good sign and it's easy to get. That's because nobody time. takes pulses properly anymore. Oh, I don't think I've got pulses. <laughs> <laughs> They're all this is dollar coming. Left it too late. And this is what I mean by sort of those um, downstream readouts. So with aortic regurge, think of the aorta. With tricuspid regurge, think about the hepatic vein because they're, su they're super helpful, these signs, when you find them. Um, specific, not sensitive, but anyway. And um, this is a patient with bad pulmonary hypertension, big RV hypertrophy, dilated, impaired, and right atrium that's the size of a house the septum is probably bowing across to the left and you know in these patients it's not atypical to to see this unimpressive color doppler so you'd be you know you could call that mild tr if you wanted to and uh, you know if you just pause it there and look at the jet you know it's not filling hardly any of the ra and this is really not surprising, right? Because all that that's telling you about is the velocity of those cells. And if you've got rapid equalization between your right ventricle and your right atrium, then you're gonna get this unimpressive Doppler signal. But if you look at the, um, if you look at the hepatic vein in this patient, you've got this really impressive 
called like systolic flow reversal. So this should be blue basically. So the blood should be going from the hepatic veins into your right atrium pretty much most of the time. You might get a brief reversal um, when your atria contracts, so a little brief bit of red. But you see, if you watch this now, it's like red, 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 red. You see there's a lot of red in there. Um, and then you can put pulse wave through that and you get this classic, oh, that classic sinusoidal systolic flow reversal. So you can see it's in systole and it's coming up in sinusoidal. And this is probably a combination of, so it's quite specific for, for TR, um, but this patient has a combination of, of, it's quite specific for severe TR, um, not that sensitive because other things can cause it like AV blocks. Um, and wouldn't AV blocks be intermittent? I, I don't think it would be as, as impressive as this because I think this patient actually has um, systolic reversal with a which is a sinusoidal pattern, which is quite classic of when you have um, severe TR and right ventricular dysfunction at the same time. So yeah, there, there's slightly different patterns for all of them. But if you're seeing if you're seeing this and and this and you know systolic flow reversal like that, you can be pretty sure that you've got a significant slash severe TR. Um, Nice one. So yeah, use those use those up and downstream readouts. They can be helpful. I think particularly in our patient group, where it's often difficult to, you know, get pretty things like PISA, and you often haven't got time as well to be. So to be from mitral. Exactly. Call me vein from mitral. Yeah, definitely. My favourite veins. And uh, diastology. So quickly for this, um, obviously it's a talk in and of itself, but I just want to show some tips and tricks for measuring. This is with relation to the mitral inflow. Just be mindful that as your LV dilates, your mitral inflow becomes more lateral. And so you've got to optimize your pictures to get a good mitral inflow trace. Um, as shown here. So this would be a, a normal size ventricle. You've got the mitral inflow right down the center of the ventricle. You're gonna have the sample gate set between one and three millimeters, and you're gonna be just at the leaflet tips as they're open. So you want your, you know, if you freeze it and, put, and your leaflet tips are there, you want your sample gate to just be at the mitral valve leaflet tips. And you're gonna get this lovely trace like this. Um, so Desh, what's this wave here? Uh, e. Yeah. And A. Nice. Um, and the thing that's nice about this is that it's um, not overgained. We're getting the modal sort of velocities. We've got nice uh, three, um, you know, three on a screen because the horizontal sweep is set nicely. And the, the, the baseline, we're not getting that ghosting artifact because the, um, we've got the low pass filter on. So this is a beautiful trace. Um, in this patient, you can see that they've got a dilated LV. We've got that mitral inflow. That's the you know, not the clearly got the you know low cardiac output state coming through there, but it just you know shows you that that flow is coming through more laterally. And if you stick your things there, you're going to completely miss the mitral inflow. So you need to bring your you need to adjust your imaging essentially and bring it round so that you're going to line up. Um, and this this trace isn't isn't this patient's, but this patient could have a trace like this because um, Louise, what does it show? It shows severe diastolic dysfunction grade three with an EA ratio above two. Uh, yeah. No. Oh, okay. Nice. Oh, so. Oh, it's an L wave. Nice. Yeah, lovely. So this is, I just showed. It's buried in the. Oh, no, the ASV. It's just the ASV. Yeah, that's yeah the but ASV. it's buried in the... Um, it's kind of... So L, but it's somewhere here, but then you've got another E wave, so the duration... No, that's, no, that's the A wave. Oh, this right. Is the, this okay. is the A wave. Um, so I was just showing here that you can see so we've got the E wave um, and then in diastasis, in diastasis where you normally don't have flow because the pressures are equal, this patient's got ongoing forward flow because their left atrial pressures are crazy high, right? Um, in the correct clinical context, right? And whenever nothing's ever certain in echo, you can say a thing and say, hang on with the caveat that, and there's always a caveat with L waves. Um, so if you have a patient that has a heart that looks like this, and has this pattern, you can be pretty certain they've got raised left atrial pressure, right? But if I took this trace in Adam, 
he probably this you might actually have this because you can get it in athletes with slow heart rates um you still get that filling in diastasis so it's all context specific right mm. but if you see a heart that looks terrible and they've clearly got diastolic dysfunction and they're not a, an athlete who's bradycardic or with a heart block then um you know your your l wave there is going to be useful for you because it tells you that the patient has raised left atrial pressure so extract all the information that you can um don't miss the l wave and this is an example as i showed you of a good trace this is and i see don't you know this is not unusual to see something that looks like this and it's terrible for all reasons so the horizontal sweep is at 25 you've got a massive gaussing artifact because you haven't turned your low pass uh, filter on um and then you know you have you just yeah don't don't measure don't make measurements on that and, uh, bring your baseline down as well because you're not really interested in in what's happening here necessarily with your pulse wave doppler mitral inflow um so aim for something like this and tissue doppler imaging or obviously measuring really small velocities of the myocardium um, the reason that we like and we call these obviously this is your tissue doppler imaging um, and this is your e prime values that generally is the one that we use so you do get an a prime as well but we tend to just use the e prime um, to either to use a standalone or as part of the e to e prime ratio so we're going to put it at the medial annulus and the lateral annulus and we get profiles that look something like this which are a reasonably good um, again you've got your low pass filter on um, and because you are measuring low velocities the stroke the sample volume of the pulse wave you can remember for the mitral inflow, it's between one and three millimeters, but for this one, it's between three and five, so you can make it bigger. The, the machine sets all of this for you, so you often don't need to think about it, but it's good to know in case someone's altered the settings and you need to put them back to where they ought to be. Um, and the scale needs to be you know, reduced. Usually 10 and 10 on each side is enough, but sometimes if it's vigorous, you know, up to 15 or 20. Um, and again, you know, don't overshoot and trace all the fuzz, but catch it where it's brightest um, and which one's usually higher lateral or medial lateral. nice and if you had the opposite way around where your medial was higher than your lateral what would that be called and what what diagnosis might you think of Just worry about the i guess the longitudinal function of the rv i don't know what that's called yeah annulus reversus nice pericarditis i would never <laughs> ever <laughs> Um, yes, so um, yes. excluding measurement errors. Um, and for the last like five minutes. <laughs> if you're, yeah, usually your lateral is higher, just to remember that. And there are some diagnoses that you might think of if you get reversal of that, which is called annulus reversus. Um, I think this is the biggest pitfall for us in the ICU is tachycardia where you get fusion of the E and the A wave. Um, and so some might mistake this as being an, an E wave and sort of measure it out and the same here, but it's not. It's it's fused with the A wave and you can't tell which is the E, which is the A. So I wouldn't I wouldn't even bother measuring this. I would just note, you know, fusion of the of the of the mitral waves uh, inflow. Um, there are other things that you can do that are not perfect, but they're reasonably specific. You can use it. You can use the isovolumetric relaxation time um, of less than 70 milliseconds. So going from here to here, or you can use the pulmonary vein systolic filling fraction of less than 40% is pretty specific for raised left atrial pressure. Um, not perfect, but you know, if you haven't got anything else and you really want to make decisions about whether the patient has raised uh, filling pressures or not, these might be useful. Final part is, is don't forget the intraatrial septum. So if we've got a patient that's got worsening hypoxia and they're peak non-responders, you have to look for a PFO. And I'm doing more and more bubble studies in the ICU. And this study by um, Lauren Brashard's group found that in 20%, almost 20% of their patients, they had shunting across their, their PFO. And by just adjusting the peak, maybe starting some you know, uh, doing other things, maybe call me plays a dilators, who knows, whatever works, but you can reduce that shunt fraction and perhaps be able to, you know, turn someone who's got severe um, PF ratios into more sort of moderate groups. So always look, always think about the PFO in, in this particular group in particular, ARDS, non-peak responder, look for the PFO. Be surprised how often we find it.
Are they cries of joy in the background? I think it might have been me crying, yeah. It was a while <laughs> back, that one. Um, and then unexplained right heart dilatation. Um, I just want to sh show this one. So if you've got someone that's got this, you can see this is the size of a house, right? You've got compression of the LV, this huge right ventricle. Um, you've got this relative atrial index, which is a really good little simple tool. Um, if you're, essentially, if your right atrium is bigger than your left, then the ratio of that's more than 0.9. But if you just eyeball them even, and the area of your, you know, your right atrium looks bigger than your left atrium, always just think in the back of your mind, could this patient have an ASD? Um, Greg Scalia's group um, looked at this and found that this relative atrial index of more than 0.9 is pretty predictive of, of ASD presence. Um, so whenever I see that, I always just make sure I look, interrogate the intraatrial septum more. Um, and this is a patient that we had um, recently in the ICU with, with hypoxia and right heart dilatation and severe pulmonary hypertension. We didn't really know why. And she turned out to have Eisenmenger physiology related to this atrial septal defect, a, second, a large secundum ASD that had been uncorrected. Um, she was in her 40s by this point. So the take home is unexplained right heart dilatation. Look for the look for the ASD. You can see it here with color as well. And we check we check for this mainly in the subcostal view because axial resolution is always going to be better better than lateral resolution. And you can see this. Um, so it looks more like a bi-directional shunt there, but mainly right to left. You can see that there's blue predominance from right to left. And then, yes, in, in right ventricular dysfunction with ARDS, which we know occurs in, I don't know, 20 to 50% of patients, um, don't always rely on your pulmonary pressures to reflect the degree of pulmonary vascular dysfunction. Because if we do that, we're going to miss significant pulmonary hypertension and maybe, you know, we can alter treatment strategies with this. So this would be a classic patient. This is a patient we've currently got in the unit. Um, he looks, this is not his echo, but his heart looked exactly like this 48 hours ago. Um, and, you know, not that impressive um, pulmonary pressures based on the Bernoulli principle and the TRV max for obvious reasons, right? You've got a ventricle that's not going to generate high pressures and you're going to have rapid equalization. So even if you've got, you know, you're not, you're not going to get reflex, uh, reflective of, of the pulmonary vascular dysfunction that's happening. And this is where I think the RVLT pulse wave Doppler trace really comes into its own. Um, so this patient, you might just stop there and say no significant pulmonary hypertension. Whereas, in fact, if you put pulse wave Doppler through the RVOT, they've got mid-systolic notching. This patient has rip-roaring pulmonary vascular dysfunction, um, raised pulmonary vascular resistance, absolutely. Um, and if you can do a few things, maybe to optimise that, it's all a bit of research based at the minute, but perhaps we can, um, you know, improve the, the PVR in these patients with simple things and, and maybe more um, targeted therapies, who knows. But um, I guess the, the take home is don't always rely on the pulmonary pressures to reflect the degree of pulmonary vascular dysfunction in ARDS, which we know is very common in this group. Um, we can max the information that we get from the RVOT. And I think um, a really good trick for intensive care uh, physicians doing echo is that you need to maximize the modified subcostal. Um, so you can see here, this is a modified subcostal view. And I often find that you get this beautiful alignment for your RVOT profile here. And you get something that looks like this. And then you would change the horizontal sweep. You see how this is set at 50. So if we change that to just get one complete envelope, you can get a really quite accurate um, measurement of the acceleration time. So the acceleration time is the time your heart takes to eject blood to reach its maximal peak velocity. And this is pretty well validated in the non-critically ill, um, that if this is less than 90 to 100, um, 100 is the cutoff in some, 90 I guess is the validated one from the Tassinovan papers where they measured it against right heart cath. So less than 90 milliseconds was about 80 three percent accurate for raised PVR above three wood units. So generally we use 90 as a cutoff. Anything below that, um, they've likely got raised pulmonary vascular resistance. Anything above 120, it's probably not that bad. It's probably normal. And then somewhere in between is sort of a gray zone. 
But I think the trend of this could potentially be useful. And especially if we're all doing standardized measurements where we're zooming like this and we're, you know, measuring the carefully, as carefully as we can the time and then repeated measurements, um, I think might be useful to track the degree of cardiovascular dysfunction that the patient has. And, and I've been doing this a, a fair bit. And I often, you know, we, in the, in some of the COVID patients or those with, um, you know, um, ARDS that are even non-COVID, you often see, you know, on day one or two, they have this notch profile. And then as you get to, to day four or five, you lose this notch profile and their, their Axel time is increasing as they're getting less sick. So it's pretty cool. And yeah, there's more than pulmonary Axel time. So pulmonary Axel time is the one that we use most often, I think. Um, as well as things like RVOT, VTI, which we do as a routine as well. So trending that can be helpful. And if you can't get a good LVOT, VTI and cardiac output from the left side, you can always try doing it on the right side if your views are better. Um, we can obviously use the pulmonary regurge to get estimates of mean and diastolic. Again, these are not validated and they're critically ill, but you can still try and get them and trend them out. And Another like a bit like the L wave, you know, extract all the information. And this is a lot of work that Susanna Price has done, um, looking at um, earlier signs of RV dysfunction, looking at RV diastolic dysfunction, and perhaps, you know, things. Well, seems you know this presystolic A wave seems to be present in those that have significant restrictive physiology of their RV, and it's just a little harbinger that you this is a patient with a, an at risk RV, um, and that we need to be taking a bit more care with with you know, protecting the RV. Um, so extract all the information possible because there's a lot there to be gained that might just help the nuance of managing these complex patients. And that's it. So the ejection or all of it really, treat them all with respectful caution. There's always going to be caveats. We need to be aware of those. Understand the, the nuance. Um, and I think keep, keep to the basics, do them well. And there's little trips and tips and tricks that can help you along your way. And that's it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.